Yikes, being frozen alive? That makes me shudder. I don't like iced coffee. When you imagine someone being frozen alive, what comes to mind? What's coming up is about to be one great story. Fridge case across history goes a long way to show us that giving mysterious and fascinating reasons, the human body has stamina enough to take on the extreme cold from all kinds of natural environments and survive. There's a movie that premiered last year by the name Breakthrough, and it was based on true events, one of my favourite kinds of movies. It was based on the true story of a young boy hailing from St. Louis who fell through a frozen lake, and believe it or not, the boy survived. We'll be looking at that specific case as well as other similar scenarios so that we can understand the following. What happens when someone is frozen alive? What medical steps are paramount to help the person recover? What happens to those who come back to life? So, let's get started. This teenager from St. Louis, Michelle Funk, a two-year-old child from Salt Lake City, and Justin Smith, a man in his mid-twenties from Lee Valley. What do you think these three have in common? The obvious is that two of them have the same last name. They are related. So the thing is, they can all say that they've died once. How's that for an icebreaker? Before we get to the nitty-gritty of how someone comes back from the dead, we have to analyze how someone is considered dead. It feels like an easy task declaring someone deceased, but is it? It's like declaring that the skies are blue or that coffee is hot. Some things are no-brainers. When a doctor is asked to determine if a person is dead and they have to call the time of death, certain things have to be considered. Here is a checklist. They're dead if they don't have a pulse, if they can't breathe for a certain period. This one is far from simple. The definitions of death can vary, but for this case, we'll focus on the pulse and breathing. John, Justin and Michelle are cases of individuals that were considered deceased after enduring extreme levels of freezing temperatures. John Smith had fallen into a frozen lake and was submerged for a good 15 minutes, and when his body was recovered, he had no pulse. He had no sign that he was breathing. Justin Smith, on the other hand, was found by his father frozen solid deep in a pile of snow, and when the paramedics showed up, they could not find a heartbeat. Michelle Funk spent 66 minutes submerged in a freezing lake, and when she was finally pulled out, they found no signs of breathing from her. Her heart monitor could not pick up a pulse. All three were clinically dead when they were found, all frozen solid, but then they fully recovered and returned to the living. What happened? Before we get there, let me indulge you a little bit about how the human body deals with extreme temperatures. What happens to the body when it begins to freeze? To truly understand that concept, we'll have to first understand hypothermia, whereby when something is running smoothly, the average temperature for the human body sits comfortably between 97.7 and 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. These temperature levels are known as normothermia. If you're running a fever as high as 99.5 or 100.9, this is known as hypothermia. Hypothermia, on the other hand, is when the temperature is below 96 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, the body is now losing more heat than it can absorb. Mild cases can show symptoms of shivering and some confusion. Confusion doesn't sound so frightening, but the severity of this type of psychological trauma can vary widely, whereby, with extreme cases, there's a phenomenon called paradoxical undressing, whereby people undress from their clothing as confusion leads them to believe that they are overheating and not freezing. Removing the clothes that are keeping you warm at this point does not help matters, but confusion is not the only thing that's in play in this situation. Studies show that a chemical slip-up in the hypothalamus causes this mind shift, this is the part of the brain that regulates body heat. Another common behavior that comes with extreme cases of hypothermia is terminal borrowing, whereby people search for tight and enclosed areas in their final moments. So, throwing away your clothes as you shiver while hiding away in a file cabinet is a sad way to go. How about we look on the bright side and you make it out of the situation? What can medical science provide? There are a few techniques you can use to track those chills, you know for sure that you're on the right path because all the methods contain the word warm somewhere in there. First off, we have passive rewarming, a sort of cozy maneuver. This is a very light case of hypothermia. The medicine, a warm blanket, and some hot chocolate. That's not too bad. Up next might come as a surprise, but airway rewarming is as good as it gets. This is applied by wearing a mask that provides humidified oxygen to the patient that seeks to warm the body. From here on, we'll be referring to extracorporeal rewarming. 
This is the point where things get less comfortable. This is where the patient's blood is drawn, warmed, and returned to the body. Just imagine some coffee being reheated in a microwave and then being returned to the thermos. In most cases, extracorporeal rewarming happens when the person has undergone surgery, and when in surgery the patient's body is cooled to slow down metabolism. This assists in limiting the risk of brain damage. This method was used to save Michelle Funk's life, and the decision to go with this method is not an easy one. Michelle's case was in 1988 when this procedure was still unique, and as aforementioned, her case was extreme since she had spent 66 minutes submerged in a frozen lake. At the age of two, her temperature was coincidentally 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Whoa. Then this was the only person who had ever recovered from being submerged that long in the water. Recovering her means that her not only having a pulse or breathing, but her brain is still functional. Pediatric cardiologist Dr. Robert Bolt would have to consider whether extracorporeal warming would be effective. He also had to figure out if the combination of procedures alongside the high level of hypothermia could result in Michelle sustaining significant brain damage. Despite this, Dr. Bolt encouraged Michelle's parents to go ahead with the operation, seeing that it was the only option at the time. After some time, the extracorporeal rewarming Michelle's temperature had begun to rise, and once it got to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, the on-site medical team heard the one thing that kept their hope alive, a gasp of air from the two-year-old. Decades later, the same method would be used for another case of extreme hypothermia for Justin Smith, whose temperature was the lowest to be ever recorded in regards to exposure to hypothermia. In Justin's case, he was found in a snowbank and not underwater. There was a bit of tissue damage, this had a huge impact on his life, and currently, he does appear to be doing well. John Smith's recovery was represented in the film Breakthrough, though his recovery in the film has a more faith-based element. While extracorporeal rewarming was used, other techniques like passive rewarming and airway rewarming also came into play, as well as 27 minutes of CPR in the attempt to restart his heart. These three cases are among many hypothermia-related incidents. If you look up these stories on Google, for instance, you'll find headlines that indicate that the individuals were dead, then they came back to life. What does it mean to be declared deceased in these circumstances? The cases we researched all had a moment where the people were considered dead, medically speaking. Although that wasn't the case, the individuals did tick off the boxes on the checklist for dead people. No pulse and no breathing. There are quite a few different opinions on what it means to be declared dead, and some of them come from the doctors themselves. A common phrase is, you're not dead until you're warm and dead, a quote from Dr. Gerald Coleman. This is the person who saved Justin Smith's life. If you like this quote, here is another good one. We've learned that there's no temperature too low that you should not try to save someone. From Thermos physiologist Gordon Giesbracht, who is affectionately and professionally known as Professor Popsicle. All of this is to say that under these circumstances, having no heartbeat or not breathing is not grounds enough to believe that someone is truly deceased. As the body cools, its metabolic rate cools down as earlier mentioned in regards to extracorporeal rewarming. A slower metabolism helps the body organs to survive under lower amounts of oxygen, and when things get colder, that metabolic rate slows down even further. This brings the body to a point of suspended animation. Suspended animation sure looks like lifelessness, but think of it like the body being on pause, and it's capable of resuming provided that it receives appropriate treatment. So, crazily, being able to endure such high levels of hypothermia is most likely what protected these people from death. Some cold-blooded creatures, like certain frogs, have the ability to freeze and thaw themselves as winter comes and goes. They lower their metabolic rates almost to a halt and put themselves in a state of suspension. There are also some fish, like the Antarctic toothfish that lives in water as cold as 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit, thanks to having blood considered to have antifreeze qualities. If you haven't had the pleasure of meeting one of these creatures yet, the microscopic organism known as the tardigrade, or water bear, is capable of enduring a frozen state for about 30 years, or more, and make a 100% recovery. He's also so cute. <clears throat> anyway, being dead is a great headline, but might do a disservice to the science of what is truly going on. Let's go back to John Smith's case. The movie Breakthrough is at its center a story of a mother doing the best she can to get her son back, and is by no means meant to offer education about the effects of hypothermia or the concept of suspended animation. 
but since it's based on a true story, I feel it necessary to point out some of the points in the story where there are disparities on what happened. For example, some of the character motivation is heavily dramatized to fit the religious goals of the film. The advertising for the film also suggests that doctors had given up on procedures to save the boy's life before the mother started praying. In reality, John's mother was quoted saying that the doctor's efforts were still underway at that moment, that 25 professionals were working on John and one man was performing CPR when she walked up to the bed and started praying. It's good to emphasize this disparity, not to take away from the spiritual elements of the film, but to ensure we don't confuse between fact and fiction. The film portrays the events of John's survival in a way to suggest that only prayer saved his life, but there were of course medical interventions that were also at stake. The combination of faith, modern medicine and the will to survive are things that cannot be ignored. With all that talk of freeze and ice, I need hot chocolate. Let me know your thoughts and comments about this story as you sip your cup of hot chocolate.